Hi everyone. Today I will be talking about how next generation sequencing and calculating the GC content of a bacterial genome could play an important role in our fight against the bacteria Neisseria gonorrhea. It answers the question, how could we use computational genomics to fight against Neisseria gonorrhea? Neisseria gonorrhea is the infamous gram-negative bacteria that causes, you guessed it, gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is the second most common bacterial sexually transmitted infection in the UK, and it infects the mucosal surfaces of the genital tract, potentially leading to symptoms such as dysuria, i.e. burning urination, pelvic pain, and fertility issues. The bacteria's high mutation rate through horizontal gene transfer and spontaneous mutation is a massive problem as it has led to cases of antimicrobial resistance. For instance, in Japan, the bacteria's mutations of GAR-A and PAR-C proteins have resulted in the development of resistance against fluoroquinoline, which is the class of antibiotics that prevents topoisomerase enzymes from aiding in DNA replication. The emerging antimicrobial resistance is a difficult issue to tackle and is the motivation behind this study. Finding and characterizing the harmful mutations in an effective and efficient manner is the key in finding potential drug targets to fight against this global disease. So how do we find these mutations? The answer is knowing the GC content of the genome. The GC content is the percentage of guanine and cytosine in the genome. For bacteria, the range of GC content is varied from being less than 25% to just about 75%, and studies suggest that this variation may be due to differences in mutation patterns. Bacteria tends to have mutational bias for AT rather than GC, so certain DNA fragments that have GC content below 50% could be suggesting areas of newly acquired DNA. Another interesting suggestion that scientists have made is that GC content could be positively correlated to bacterial characteristics such as having larger and more complex genomes or being aerobic, free-living, nitrogen-fixing, as well as optimally growing at a higher temperature and living in complex environments. The reason for these correlations is hypothesized to be due to synthesis of GTP and CTP nucleotides being more energetically expensive than ATP and UTP. However, it is important to note that the above correlations are not very strong, as confounding variables or selection bias may be involved. Nevertheless, we will see later on if the GC content of Neisseria gonorrhea will match up to these characteristics. So how did I find the GC content of Neisseria gonorrhea's genome? I first received raw reads of the bacterial genome and assembled it using Unicycler. Looking at his results, I found that the per base sequence quality established that the read quality decreased towards the end of the sequence reads, meaning that there were errors in the sequences that would have led to misassembly. To remove these errors, I trimmed the raw reads, resulting in 91.3% of both reads surviving. Since reduction in read lengths could affect the contiguity and completeness of the assembled genome, I ran fast QC on these trimmed reads to ensure quality control. I then used the Velvet Assembler, a de novo assembly that employs the De Bruyne graph framework to construct a genome assembly for both raw and trim reads at Kamer values of k equals 43, 53, 63, and 73. The reason why we tested for different Kamers was to find the optimum Kamer value that finds the optimal path in assembling the most contiguous and complete genome. Consequently, I found that the trim reads at k equals 63 was the best use for genome assembly because the N50 scores was the highest compared to other Kamer values and the number of scaffolds longer than 200 BP was lower than its raw reads. As a side note for those who do not know the terms, N50 is the sum of all largest contigs portraying 50% of the complete assembly, so the larger it is, the more contiguous the genome assembly. We also want less number of scaffolds longer than 200 BP, as that also indicates a more contiguous genome assembly. Think about it like finishing a puzzle. It is easier to complete a puzzle with few pieces rather than several. Therefore, the less number of scaffolds means the puzzle, i.e. our genome, will be easier to assemble. Therefore, our decision to pick trim reads at k equals 63 assures our genome assembly of Neisseria gonorrhea is complete and contiguous. Using the assembled genome constructed by Velvet for trim reads at k equals 63, the software PROCA predicted the genes. Different formats of the predicted genes were produced, including forms of amino acid sequences and the nucleotide sequences, and some of these files included annotations that identify the purposes of a specific gene. BLAST assured that the bacterial genome was Neisseria gonorrhea, and a Python code was then used to identify the GC content of each contig and the overall genome. Here is a little bit of explanation of my Python code. 
I first created variables GC and AT because these are the nucleotides that I wanted to count. I didn't feel the need to separate each nucleotide because as you recall from the equation, the numerator includes both guanine and cytosine, while the denominator includes all nucleotides. I also created the variable unknown just in case the sequence had an unknown nucleotide. I then found the amount of guanine and cytosine and total number of nucleotides for each contig except for the last sequence. I then turned the number of guanine and cytosine for each contig into a list called list GC, and I turned the total number of each contig into a list called list total. However, since the code did not include the last contig, the code over here, as you can see on the screen, ensures that I have counted guanine and cytosine as well as nucleotides in the last contig. Before I want to move on to how I calculated the GC content of the entire genome, I want to emphasize that I have also managed to count the GC content for each contig, as you can see here and here. So how did I calculate the overall GC content? I added the integers in the list to the respective values from the last contig to find the total number of guanine and cytosine in the entire genome, as well as the total number of nucleotides in the entire genome. And then using the equation, I managed to find the overall GC content. The results found that the total number of guanine and cytosine in the entire genome amounted to around 2 million nucleotides and that there were around 3.9 million nucleotides in the entire genome. Therefore, the overall GC content was calculated at 51%. It must be emphasized that multiple contigs had a GC content lower than 50%. Remember that because it's important. For a more detailed explanation of my methods, please refer to the report that I have written for this study. There, I have expanded more on how the tools work and assured that they are reliable in assembling a complete and contiguous genome, identifying the bacteria as Neisseria gonorrhea, and calculating the GC content. So what can we understand from this GC content? Like I said before, GC content can be used to identify new mutations, but it has also been suggested that it has a positive correlation to certain bacterial characteristics. Considering that the overall GC content of this bacteria is only slightly above 50%, and recalling that the above correlations are not even strong in the first place, it is not surprising that Neisseria gonorrhea do not support these correlations. What's most important is how GC content identifies new mutations, as Neisseria gonorrhea frequently exchanges chromosomal genes. Fortunately, we have found multiple contexts to have a GC content below 50%, and as we have said that bacteria tends to have mutational bias for AT, we could expect that these contexts are areas of recently acquired DNA in the genome. In order to identify these mutations, I suggest using PROCAS annotations to predict the genomic features of contexts that have GC content below 50%, as I believe it is a good starting point in understanding how the mutation has affected the genes. For example, we know that recombination of PLI genes in the 1990s led to antigenic variation that fortified Neisseria gonorrhea against host immune response. Finding mutations similar to this sort of example could therefore be a big help to public health, as we could find drug targets to tackle this disease. So what are the take-home messages? Computational genomics is the future. It is now a faster, cheaper, and more accurate method for identifying new mutations, and it allows us to illustrate the evolution of diseases. While my study focused on Neisseria gonorrhea, the method that I have used could apply to other pathogens. For instance, we can apply it to the current pandemic. Although vaccines against coronavirus is starting to be produced, mutations of this virus could lead to ineffectivity of these vaccines and a surge of infections. It is vital that we use the next generation sequencing to rapidly assemble these genomes and we could calculate the GC content to identify harmful mutations and prevent future outbreaks. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and please let me know if you have any questions.